Okay, perfect. Recording. Okay, so we're week four now um, in the final element analysis course. So the plan, as always, is to start with a recap of last lecture. I'll go through very briefly um, some of the things we covered last week. I'll also give you the motivation again. And the whole point of this is to keep bringing you back. The reason we're solving these equations, the reason we're talking about straight lines and interpolation functions um, is grounded in physics. It is so that we can actually solve these physical equations and I'll, I'll try to hopefully motivate that and at least give you some reason to think this is uh, more than just abstract mathematics. We're then going to look at the solution to this one-dimensional differential equation. Now, um, depending on whether you've worked through, you'll notice that this is essentially just one extra term, but it actually adds quite a bit of extra complexity to the solution. And I'll talk a bit about what this actually means physically and why this is an interesting uh, differential equation to study. I'll give you a brief overview of solving this equation in MATLAB um, and just show you some example solutions. And again, they'll be available on Blackboard and you'll be able to play around with those both in the week and also next week when you come to the lab sessions. We'll then start to move to two dimensions. So what I'm hoping by spending so long on one dimensions is that the move to two dimensions uh, seems, if not clear, because essentially it's, it's just the same thing but with more mathematics and slightly more um, complexity, but hopefully the whole process seems familiar. So we have exactly the same concepts, we do exactly the same process, we define exactly the same interpolation functions and we work through, get properties of those and then use those in order to actually derive finite element equations. So I'm, I'm hoping by, by sort of really understanding the one dimensional case that the two dimensional case makes sense and is hopefully a trivial extension. Now, I appreciate that when you start getting to two dimensions, the matrices become bigger, it becomes more complicated. And you'll find this in the assessed exercise that, you know, essentially very quickly you can kind of get lost in the details. And uh, the trick with all of these problems, and, and especially with writing computer code, is to keep breaking it down into simple parts. To take it to the simplest possible example, understand that example, and then apply that to more complicated cases. But within the labs, I'll be there. I can help you guide you through that. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll, you'll understand the process um, you know, for both one dimensions and the extension to two dimensions. And then if you need to in the future, to three dimensions. So the, the aim for today really is just to reinforce that one dimensional Helmholtz equation. Um, I'll explain what a Helmholtz equation is. Um, and then I'll show you the MATLAB code to do that and show you how that works. And again, you can play with that yourself. Um, we really want to understand what two-dimensional differential equations are and the key difference from moving to that. So I'll go back over the concept of two-dimensional fields, just explain fundamentally what the difference is between the two mathematically. Intuitively, I think you've all got at least a, a decent understanding of that living in three-dimensional space. But, you know, just from the point of view of this, defining equations and solving them, that will make sense, hopefully. Um, and we're going to talk about the mathematics of a triangular element for two-dimensional equations. Now, it's probably the most commonly used finite element. It's not the only one. And I'm, I'm hoping... Probably next week we'll focus on just getting you so that you can actually answer the, the assessment exercise. I and mean, that's really been the aim of this, to give you the tools to be able to answer the assessment exercise. What I want to do towards the end of this course is to actually then start to give you some sort of general purpose advice and uh, talk about different elements, different orders of accuracy, and give you a kind of broader picture. But I really want you to have a kind of firm foundation before we start to then talk about the, the kind of art of the application of this in industry. And hopefully all of that will make a lot more sense then in the context of you know, understanding the fundamentals. Um, but really, the triangular element is the simplest example in two dimensions um, and has some nice properties. Uh, yeah, and then finally, I'll talk about, um, we probably won't get to the point where we'll solve the equation, but I'll just show you mathematically um, that process, and then we can go through that um, next lecture. So we're now in week five, lecture four. And just to make you aware that 11 o'clock next week, you should be in 138 in Howell for the first of our lab sessions. Um, and then we also have, then have a lecture in the afternoon. Um, at two o'clock, uh, again in this lecture theatre. Um, so just make sure you're, you're aware of that. As always, the QR code's there in the corner. Please use it just to register for this course. Um, feel free to provide feedback. I don't think many people put too much last week, but really appreciate it if you just, you know, even if you're just feeding back and saying, you know, seems okay, that's, that's really useful. Um, you know, too fast, too slow, spending too much time on simple one-dimensional cases, whatever, please, any feedback's really, really appreciated. Um, and I'll keep doing my best to kind, kind of tailor the content based on that. Okay, so first three lectures, hopefully this um, is familiar. So we, we really started with the kind of motivation, talked about differential equations, solutions, um, limitations. Then we talked, and we've done quite a lot of work on deriving the one-dimensional shape functions and then using those to solve FEA equations. 
So lecture two, we recapped that, talked again about shape functions, and then talked about how we solve differential equations. And we're using the very, very simple case of dt2 by dy squared is equal to zero. So this equation um, here. So this equation here. Okay. And then lecture three, we, we basically talked a bit more about a more complicated equation. This was that differential equation with a force term on the right-hand side. So that's when it's being driven. And then finally, I finished by giving you the Helmholtz equation, which is this one in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so today, we're going to move to two dimensions, um, talk about triangular shape functions and then solving in, in two dimensions. Okay, so starting from the kind of overall idea of, of differential equations and, and you know the key concept that I kind of keep hammering home and I, hopefully you're starting to at least appreciate the, the importance of this is this this idea of the calculus this idea of a derivative so you know all of this is just an approximation to the real world the real world is described by differential equations um, physically and mathematically what we define are these functions and these functions are approximations to the real world um, and then those functions allow us to define derivatives using the calculus. Those derivatives in the limiting case that you can zoom in as far as you want give us differentials. And those differentials give us differential equations. Now these are the three differential equations we've actually looked at so far. So the top one is, is just equal to zero. And a solution to that, as we've seen before, is just basically a straight line if you stick in the boundary conditions. Um, the second one is essentially equal to a constant and that gives you a parabolic solution. And then the final one, which we actually solve directly, gives you this series of sines and cosines. So you can see, depending on the, the, the actual type of equation, you get very, very different behavior. So just to make that clear, and you've seen this a few times, but basically if we integrate this equation twice, we end up with this form if it's equal to zero, and that just gives us you know, the straight line solution. The parabolic one, because we have this f term, that ends up getting an x uh, here, and then the x squared, and then you stick in boundary conditions. In this case, the boundary conditions is just equal to zero. And then for this uh, equation, we'll come back to that in a bit, but, but, but essentially this allows us to define a solution that's a sum of sine and a cosine function. Now the form we had here was basically just a, a constant, but if you put in a coefficient, what you can see is that gives us multiples of sines and cosines. Um, and you'll know from you know, working with Fourier transforms that that then starts to allow you to define arbitrary functions as series of sines and cosines. Okay, so let's talk just a little bit about the motivation here. So we talked before about the kind of Navier-Stokes equation, and this is, you know, a very, very complex equation, nonlinear, um, all sorts of very, very uh, complicated flow behaviour emerging from partly this convection term here, which is, you know, what, what gives turbulence and the unsteady behaviour. But essentially we have a time evolution, we have the kind of flow of fluid or convection carried by this kind of complex flow, we have a driven pressure gradient, and then we have this diffusion, which is kind of a spreading effect. So, you know, these, these different terms each describe different physical phenomena. And remember, this, this equation is just Newton's law, written in a particular way. So, you know, it's a fundamental physical equation, and it's written here for fluid dynamics. If you go and work in a finite element company and work on fluids, this is the equation you're solving behind the scenes with, with some additions. So, some examples, you know, this is turbulent flow in a channel. Um, this is the complex like, fluid structure interaction um, with a turbine, but you can see the kind of interaction of flow. And then this is an example of boiling, where you see the, the, the kind of flow and, and change of phase. So just to link that to the, the, the kind of different equations we've seen so far, um, you remember that essentially what I showed you before is it's this diffusion term here that we were solving. So the diffusion term um, for the case when mu d2u by dy squared, so that's just a one-dimensional case, is equal to zero. This particular case is what's called coet flow, and that could be a case where you have a sliding top ball, for example. And in that case, you remember the straight line solution for that would basically just give you, just because of the act of diffusion, your fluid is driven by that. And this, this is a really kind of common case in tribology between a bearing, for example, or maybe when you're driving a car, the gap between the, the, the road and the car itself would, would have a flow <coughs> like this. Maybe a ship near a bottom of a surface would have that. If we incorporate pressure gradient term, and you can think of this in general, pressure gradient is generally over a large distance. It can be thought of as a force, or it could be, be a gravity force. This essentially becomes a, a force term, is equal to that. And in this case, you could think of a channel flow where <coughs> essentially we have water being pumped through this. And this is in a pipe in your house, for example, um, or any kind of industrial pumping situation. And you would get a parabolic profile. So hopefully you can start to see these equations are actually giving you some, some kind of key physics for, for kind of low Reynolds lambda flow. If you start to incorporate turbulence and more complicated flow, then you start to get kind of these, these more complicated flow features that 
um, potentially a time evolving. But really, for, for our purposes today, we're interested in solving just the kind of um, linear part, the right hand side, if you like. For solid mechanics, and these were some of the examples I talked about before, the kind of simple just stress strain on the left hand side here. Um, we've also got in the middle here the, the turbine, which is you know, you, you see a, a blade shearing off, and this is quite non-linear, or a car crashing into a wall, and you get the kind of compression of that. And again, this is Newton's law written in continuum form. And just to give you a couple of examples of how we'd use this, one of them is to approximate this stress term here as basically the divergence dot of some material coefficients. In this case, you know, lambda and uh, mu times... Sorry about this, it's not easy to type on this. Um, lambda plus 2 mu times some strain term. So this would be, um, of, this would essentially be your strain rate here. And in doing that, we actually end up with this term basically giving you a strain rate. And if we don't have any time evolution or any acceleration in this case, we end up with the Navier equation. And this would give you essentially the, the same equation we've already solved and could, could define, say, a, a, soft, a test piece, say, stretching or shearing to a particular case, or in the action of kind of an applied force. If you have no body forces and you actually rearrange this and just keep the acceleration term, you can actually end up with a wave equation. And I'll come back to that in a sec. But essentially, so this, this equation and, and within the terms we've talked about already, we've already started to look at both, you know, the, the kind of stretching of, of a solid and also, you know, the case for, for a wave equation. Now, to give you a couple of examples of how a wave equation works, and this is the form of the Helmholtz equation you've seen. On the left, we've got essentially standing waves in a spring. So you can see that these are kind of sines and cosines on the left-hand side. And depending on, in a guitar, depending on the, the kind of frequency of, of vibration, you get different standing wave solutions. So what you can see here, hopefully, is that, you know, the solution to this equation does actually give you something that, that kind of physically represents uh, something you see in reality. And then the importance to engineering is, and I'm sure you've probably seen this video, but the kind of classic example of, of, of wave solutions and resonance is a bridge where wind causes resonance and you end up with basically <laughs> kind of sinusoidal motion that ended up destroying the bridge essentially. So, you know, this Helmholtz equation that we finished with last week is actually essential to this type of behaviour. We now have an equation that can describe that. For electromagnetism, again, I'm, I'm no expert in this, but, you know, one thing you can do is you can rearrange these equations to give you essentially a wave equation, a Helmholtz-style equation that's to do with the wave in electro, uh, electric and mag magnetism. So essentially this, this form of the equation is the form of a wave equation here. And you can see this is kind of the, the term we've been talking about. This term would essentially be the, the constant in that case. So, you know, essentially describing um, electromagnetic phenomenon with this Helmholtz style equation, potentially we can kind of look at those sort of cases as well. The energy equation we talked about, um, hang on one second. So the energy equation we talked about, and you know, you've got the various terms, the, the time evolution, that's the change in time of, of the energy, it's equal to the advection, the flow of energy, the work done as the, the, the kind of heat stretches the fluid, and you can kind of see here how that would work with these really complicated structures in, in fluid flow. And then the kind of conduction term, or heat flux, which is Q. So, you know, again, this is a, a statement of the conservation of energy written in this continuum form. And the kind of key equations here, we, we said before, with Fourier's law, which essentially we take this Q here, and it's the divergence of that Q, which gives us essentially minus K D2T by DX squared. And that essentially models the conduction in a, in, a, in a rod. And this example here is different metals, and you can see they conduct at different rates because of this different k coefficient here. So again, we now have an equation that, that can kind of, kind of model some of that phenomenon. Now finally, we come to the, the, the idea, the, the um, equation we're going to solve in the exercises. And you can see this contains lots of the, the physics of the problems of interest. So we do have this Helmholtz term. We have this forcing term, which could be a body force. It could be an applied pressure gradient. It could be you know, a range of different things. Notice one thing we haven't talked about before is the inclusion of this coefficient inside the derivative. And this actually gets into uh, concepts of kind of material properties being um, non-isotropic. So with heat, for example, you can have a structure where the heat would conduct more rapidly in one direction than another. Also in, say, seepage in rocks, this becomes very important. And again, this, this part of the model is something you can explore um, as part of the exercise. Okay, so let's just start with the Helmholtz example, the equation we solved last week. Um, and you remember I said basically the, the way to solve this is really just to go to a textbook on differential equations, look up how you solve second order homogeneous linear uh, differential equations with constant coefficients. So that's essentially the process. There's a characteristic equation you go through and you end up with a solution of this form. So what I'd like you to do today is just to start by putting in the boundary conditions to that um, and just see whether or not you get a solution or which solution you get for that. <coughs> 
um, in this particular case. And, and when you're doing this, bear in mind, essentially these boundary conditions are going to define in the same way that the, the way you tune a guitar defines which waves you see now and which sound you hear. Essentially, how you tune these boundary conditions. So what you're doing at the, 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 the x equals 0 and x equals 1, the two ends, will determine which wave solution we see. So try putting in these boundary conditions and see which solution you get to this, and which kind of wave uh, solution. For this, I was going to try this. So Bruno, I've been trying this poll everywhere. I'm not sure how well this will work, but it's probably worth a try just to see whether it's... Um... <clears throat> so the idea is, I think you can basically... Um, if you go to this website, you can actually answer which you think. There's four possible answers on there. If you, if you work through this, and as soon as you've got an answer, put it on there. Um, and then it will come up on the screen and, and give me an idea of basically who, who's chosen which answer. So we can get an idea. So, so work through that and try actually applying these boundary conditions to get these coefficients. You want to get A and B, and then go to this website and actually choose the correct answer from that website. There's four possible answers. Only one of them is correct. Um, let me just show you. So if you go to this website here, you can basically choose from one of these four answers. Um, so one of these four answers is correct. Um, three of them are wrong. And it'll give me an idea basically of, of how, how you're getting on in terms of understanding this. Maybe about uh, five or ten minutes. How are we doing for time here? Maybe five minutes for this. Does that make sense? Any questions? Or? I'm not sure if this is worth trying, but they, <laughs> they've got a subscription to it, so I thought I'd give it a go. Yeah. By the way, this is a general form for f of x. You, you, the t here is basically the, the function you should be substituting, just in case you're confused by the notation. This is just because it's a general solution, f of x. You think of this as t of x, if you're confused by that, but essentially it should be 
these t of x would be the values of the boundary. So I think almost everyone's got the right answer of who's responded. Oh, hang on a second, we've got... I see, so how does it work? So 11 people have participants, but I guess it means you haven't necessarily uploaded the answer yet. Um, interesting. I'll give you a couple more minutes. Okay, yeah, we should move on. So, it was good, yeah, okay, so most people have got the right answer here. Um, let me just show you the process. Um, so essentially, what we're trying to do here is we have A cosine X plus B sine X, um, and that's equal to, sorry, sorry. So that's t 
as a function of x is equal to that. And we're going to use the boundary conditions that t at 0 is equal to 100 and t at 1 is equal to 0. So the first question is, you know, in terms of, um, well, mathematically in terms of the process, essentially all we do is we substitute in the value of, of 0 into this. So that's going to be equal to a times the cosine of 1, uh, so 0, plus b times the sine of 0. So the sine of 0 is just equal to 0. And the cosine of 0 is equal to 1. So we end up with basically a is equal to 100. So that's the first term. For this term here, we essentially um, substitute in a value of 1. Now, quick question. In terms of this um, trigonometrically, 1 is basically... I mean, how, how do you think this is going to look? Is this going to be a complete function, or is it going to be... Anyone? I mean, is it going to be, you know, is it going to be a harmonic if you think about musical analog with, with a uh, guitar? Anyone? So we're essentially, I mean, it's a strange choice of x being one because it should really be a multiple of two pi um, in radians. But essentially, putting in a value of one hundred cosine, sorry, cosine of one plus b sine of 1, and then you have to actually do this on your calculator in, in radians, and that's equal to 0. So we can just rearrange, and we see that b is going to be equal to minus 100 cosine of 1 divided by sine of 1, which is going to be minus 100, um, I think that's 1 over tangent of 1, if you like. But, and then if you put that into your calculator in radians, you end up with the form um, 60... 4.21 for b. But what you see if you plot this, and we'll come back to this later, is actually this is not an entire cycle. So in terms of a waveform, this wouldn't actually be a complete cycle. And what you would see um, essentially is it's not a harmonic solution to uh, the equations of motion. But we'll come back to this. So hopefully that made sense. And I think most people kind of got that, that answer there. So hopefully you've got at least a feel for the way the underlying function should look, and the one we're going to solve using finite element analysis. Okay, so the process of finite element analysis, we've, we've got the exact solution there. What we've done is we've basically got a kind of textbook solution using the, the, the kind of mathematical limiting case, and that gives us an exact solution. As I've said several times, there are very, very few functions we can do this for. This happens to be one of them. But the more general method is, is kind of to basically take the, the approximation for some you know, finite part of the curve approximated as a series of straight lines, and then use this kind of a finite element method to, to approximate our function in some way. So we're essentially taking some function, in this case u of x, as a series of straight lines. Each of these straight lines we call an element. Um, the point where they meet, essentially joined up, um, is continuous, and they're fitted as close as possible to the underlying function. So again, just the terminology, u of 1 is, is the value of u at x equals 1. They're called nodes where they join. Element numbers uh, are the actual numbering of the element. And again, these are all important definitions as we go to higher dimensions. Okay, so the task really is to define this straight line function. I've shown you this several times. Um, hopefully, hopefully it seems familiar, but you know, essentially the process of defining an element in terms of n1 and n2, so it's just algebra. You solve for u1 and u2, gives you mx plus c, you rearrange, you get this form of the element equation. And then the derivative has a nice well-defined form that's just u2 minus u1 over h, where h, um, if you recall, is just x2 minus x1. So notice what's quite nice about this, and again, this will be the same thing we'll get when we go to triangles in two dimensions, is this is actually a constant. There's no uh, x dependence in this actual derivative here. So the actual straight line, the der derivative of a straight line is a constant, and that's not surprising, but that means it has quite nice properties in terms of integration. The integration of these functions, if you remember, was fairly tedious. We had to work through, but, but once we'd done that, we ended up with basically the trapezium rule. And again, this is just a statement, essentially, that the area under a straight line it's just basically, um, you know, the base times the height uh, between those two. So, you know, again, this is all nicely consistent. Okay, so we've got these kind of shape functions that define essentially an approximation to our underlying function. We write our equation we want to solve in the form a u minus f is equal to zero, and then the approximation to that, where we just replace that u with u for the element. So that's just the, the elements, the straight lines, and then we do a least squares minimization. We're basically minimizing the error between the true solution and the approximation to the solution as a set of straight lines. 
That's the kind of motivation, that's the underlying thing that gives us the mathematics. So the differential equation we're going to talk about here, um, which we is the Helmholtz equation, which we know the solution is going to be a series of sines and cosines. So what's nice about this is we know that whatever form we have of a series of straight lines can never be exact. Those, those sines and cosines are, as I said before, transcendental functions. There is no exact solution. So essentially what we had to do is approximate that in some way. So what we do here is we, we basically use the, the, the same trick. We use the, the, the least squares fit. We integrate over a, a volume. Uh, omega. I should make a note about this, this, this notation here. This is kind of general notation for integration over a volume. Now in one dimension the volume is just x. One dimensional volume is just a straight line. In two dimensions that integral over this omega becomes integral over area. And in three dimensions over the volume. But just, just be aware that this is kind of the general way of just writing something. In our particular case in one dimension this just becomes integral over x. Um, and in our case x1 to x2. But um, it's a kind of general notation for, for, for integral over that area. Okay, so the, the process is the same, and it'll be the same when we go to two dimensions. Use integration by parts to rewrite the left-hand side as two first derivatives, first-order terms, um, plus the surface terms. Then we replace those derivatives with the linear approximations. And you know this, this property of them being basically constant in x becomes quite nice because the integral becomes very, very uh, simple. The difficulty here you'll see is this actual term here has two new terms that are in terms of n1 and u1, n2 and n u2. So what we have here, as I mentioned last week, is basically the product of two linear functions. So what we're trying to do here is we're actually trying to integrate two functions, both of which are a function of um, these shape functions that are a function of x. So our, our, our problem has actually become much more complicated for this particular term. X. So if you see, we've actually got an x-dependence in um, just highlight these. So these shape functions here, because they're not, we're not taking derivative, these all have an x-dependence. So we're actually having to integrate over x for those terms. So instead, what we do is we actually rewrite the shape functions um, from the, the, the coordinate system we had before that was in terms of x, x1 and x2, as a, a general kind of shape function um, between minus 1 and plus 1. So the advantage of doing this, this, this mapping as it's called, is essentially it makes the mathematics easier to work with. And this is exactly the same trick you use in integration where you use a, a substitution and you approximate a function in, in that way. Um, and essentially what we're doing here in, in one dimensions is, is doing that same process. So um, the, the mathematics is exactly the same. We approximate that straight line as mx or m psi plus c. And then we, we substitute in the values of psi is equal to minus one um, here and psi is equal to one here. And then we basically just work through and we get exactly the same shape functions that we got before. So I wanted to just give you maybe 10 minutes just to actually work through this yourself for these shape functions. Um, basically just work through that process. And I showed you the first part last week, how you actually get the shape functions to get the function of that form and then link that to the interpolation function here. So the steps are essentially we have to get these two equations. You solve these in order to get this. So you want to get n1 and n2. And these, these should be functions purely just of psi. Um, let me just write the, the general form actually, u of psi is equal to m psi plus c. So essentially what you're doing is you're, you're combining those two together to get a u element expression in terms of psi. And then what you do is you equate that n1 of psi to the expression you had before for the interpolation function in terms of x. Now what's the reason for doing this is what we then have is basically the, the equivalence between these shape functions in this coordinate space that always goes from minus 1 to plus 1, which will be the same for any element. It's a, it's a nice, well-controlled uh, uh, setup of the shape functions to any shape function we, we physically have in reality. And this is what's known as a mapping or transform. So you, you, you've probably seen this before, a Jacobian or a transform. And you know usually when you see this, you're like, this, this sounds kind of pretty, pretty complicated. But the whole point of it is to make life simpler. As long as you can define the mapping, what you can do is basically just using a, a, a mapping which is really just the derivative of x, the real coordinate, with respect to the, the kind of psi, this, this, this kind of uh, shape function coordinate. Mm -hmm. By doing that, you can actually re-express that straight line always between minus 1 and plus 1. It becomes much easier to integrate. So really this process of defining the Jacobian we want to do here just gives you an idea of, of then how that would work in higher dimensions. And when you go to most commercial codes, when you look at most finite element analysis, what they'll do is define really complicated elements. You do meshing, you get this really complicated grid of points, which you've seen before. They'll map all of that to a uniform, simple domain, solve that, map back. And it's, it's a much more efficient process, it's much easier to work with, because 
However complicated your elements are, you can always map them um, essentially to, to this form. So just to give you an idea how that works, if you work through this process of just defining these shape functions, equate those two, and then try to get this form here. I'll give you 10 minutes. And then there's, for this poll, got a solution here where you can see whether you get the right form for that. And again, please feedback whether this polling thing is just stupid or whether you think it's useful. Um, I've, I've not tried it before, so. So really, what is the correct mapping between these two, uh, psi and x? Let's have a look. So, share. Oh, one second. So I think I have to activate that. So I deactivate that one and activate this one. So now I think you go to the same link and it should be, should be that poll. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, I think it's the same link again. So yeah, hopefully now that this poll should be... Yes, perfect. So then, then you can see, you basically have to answer what you think the correct mapping is. So that is the correct mapping if you work through... Um, right, one second. So this is the correct mapping if you work through this process of defining the shape function, getting the shape function in this form, equating that shape function, or the n1 part of that shape function, to n1 in terms of x. And you've got that here, it's just x2 minus x over h. And then you just take the derivative um, of x with respect to psi. And then the form you should get will give you the answer to that um, online expression. Does that make sense? Or completely... Yeah, let me just... And any questions, please feel free to come down or stick your hand up or whatever. Or if you're completely confused. <laughs>
Well, yeah, by the way, so just in terms of the form you get, it'll be equal to, this would be equal to, say, some value, say, f of, um, well, some, some, some function, let's just say this is a, and then what you, the actual form you, they, they, I asked for is, is basically a times d psi. So it's just, all you're doing at the end, the last step is basically just to split that derivative up um, into, into two parts, kind of notational abuse. Like you would with um, um, basically just solving first order during differential equation. Okay, what I think I'll do is I'll just push on. So I wanted to get, basically just go through very quickly the key parts of the derivation um, that we had as for basically for lecture three at the end, I talked about the Helmholtz equation. The one you should have read between lectures. Um, what I'll do is I'm just gonna go through those kind of key points of that derivation. This is kind of one of the key steps in that derivation. Um, what I'll do is I'll leave the poll open, so you feel free to keep adding answers to that. And we can have a quick look at that again 
maybe in about 20 minutes, half an hour's time. But I just want to kind of work through that part. Then we can have a quick break and then I'll go to two dimensions just so we have time to finish all, all of that before. So, so just very briefly, the kind of motivation for these shape functions. So they provide a way to standardize and make the integral easier. Um, and you can think of this as a kind of mapping um, from the elements to the real space, um, where essentially the, the element is simpler to integrate in, in this kind of uh, simpler space between one and zero, or minus one and plus one, sorry. So re remember before, the integral is between x1 and x2, that's the length of the, the element. Um, and then for element two, that would be between x2 and x3. And so for each element, that would be different. Potentially each element would be a different length. There would be, essentially, when you're writing code, you'd have to write a bit of code for each of the elements individually. The advantage here is that we basically just have one standard process from minus one to plus one, always the same range. It also makes the, the, the mathematics easier because actually the, the limits are no longer kind of constants and each of these functions become you know, a much simpler form. Um, sorry, the original? No, no. Okay. So isoparametric parametric elements, which you'll see in the literature, roughly speaking, mean that this mapping is possible. Um, it has a kind of more detailed meaning in terms of the, 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 the function actually being expressed um, in the same form as the, the, the shape functions themselves. But essentially this idea of mapping is important in two and more dimensions where these integrals are actually going to become far more difficult. And you can see, well at least imagine for a triangle, some arbitrary triangle, if you can map that to basically being half of a square, it's a much easier problem to solve. If you think about how you'd actually integrate over the area of a triangle, um, it's not a trivial exercise. You're integrating between three intersecting lines and that integral is, is an absolute nightmare. So, you know, this process does just make your life easier. Okay, so I just want to talk through this new term and I want to kind of give you a broad overview of this, this process. So, you know, the, the, the new term we've got here um, as part of this solution and it's part of this kind of overall solution where this term we've seen several times. We, we write in this form and use the T and W by, by linear approximations. And then we collect the simultaneous equations for each node and put in a matrix so we can solve. So I just want to show you that again um, using a notepad. So <clears throat> perfect. So the idea really here is that we want to solve an equation of the form integral uh, omega dt d2t by dx squared plus t dx, and that's between x1 and x2, okay? So this, this process you've seen several times for this first term here. We rewrite this using integration by parts um, in the form, it's basically equal to the expression for the limits, which is dt dx, and that's between x1 and x2. So this is just integration by parts and then we get this expression here between x1 between x1 and x2 for d omega dx dt dx. Now the key point about this is that actually by doing this both of these are constants so this integral becomes much much simpler. And you remember before we said this is the surface term And this is the internal term. And the reason for this terminology is the surface term, if you remember before, is the one that cancels between the elements. And you, know, you can see this is of the, of the form of being at the two ends of the element. If you think about the element like this, the surface term are the values at both ends. The internal term is the one that actually describes what's happening in between. So this is I. Um, when we go to two dimensions, this obviously becomes much more important because the surface becomes the area outside or the integral around the outside of, say, a, a triangle. Um, but understanding it in one dimension hopefully will make it clearer. So the process for the internal term, as you've seen several times, is essentially one of substituting in the, the known expressions we have for these shape functions. So if you remember before, omega 2 minus omega 1 over h, t2 minus t1 over h. All we've done is stuck in the expressions for the derivative of the, the element functions that you've seen several number of times, dx. Now this integral dx between x1 and x2 is just h. So we end up by integrating this. These are both constant. So we end up performing this integration and this just gives us another h on top, which cancels with one of the h's here. So we end up with an expression here for the internal term that's just 1 over h times these two. <coughs> 
So that's essentially this, this process. And you've seen that several times for the last, both the, the case where it's equal to zero and for the forcing term. This surface term, we rewrite that. So this whole expression is minus. If we had add on the surface term here, this essentially gives us omega 2 dt by dx at x2 minus omega 1 dt by dx at x1. So this is just the surface term. So our entire expression here is, is basically just these two expressions. But now we have this extra term up here. So this, this extra term here is basically the one we want to integrate. So then this is essentially the integral of dt dx by d1 x2. So if we rewrite this, we expand out, we end up with omega 1 n1 plus omega 2 n2 times t1 n1 plus t2 n2. That's too small, sorry, let me zoom in a bit. Um, dx. So then what we end up doing is we end up multiplying out each of the terms. So that gives us omega 1 t1 times the integral of n1 squared plus omega 2 t1 plus omega 1 t2 times the integral of n1 n2 dx plus omega 2 t2 integral of n2 squared dx. So essentially all we've done here is just multiply out these terms by this, this term by this, this term by this, this term by this, and then collect together the terms which are a function of x under the integral sign. All of these are constants, so we can just move them outside of the integral sign. So our problem then becomes one of actually just integrating these three expressions. So they're now a square of these shape functions. So for example, let me just show you the integral of, of n1 squared dx between x1 and x2. So essentially what we do here is we rewrite them as the shape functions that we've just talked about. So in order to do that, we use the approximation for dx. Now, what you should have got in the, the previous section is that the x by d psi is equal to h over 2. If you didn't get that, please uh, feel free to come and ask me or, or double check. But essentially what that ends up giving us is that actually the mapping or the change of variables is h over 2 d psi. So essentially what we do is we replace... In this particular expression, we rewrite that with the integral now between the limits of 1 and minus 1, because we're doing ds of n1 squared h over 2 d psi. So we've just used that substitution there for the limits and for the, the integration. <coughs> now our expression for n1, if you remember, in terms of psi, is basically equal to 1 minus psi over 2. Um, so what we end up having here is the integral between 1 minus psi over 2 brackets h over 2, so this is all squared, d psi. That's between minus 1 and plus 1. Does that make sense? Anyone completely confused or seem okay? So all we've done is we've used this expression here for the shape function, and we've used essentially this, this mapping or change of variables. And this is exactly what you do with integration when you have complicated integrals. You use the substitution, and then you use the, the relationship of the substitution to, 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 to replace the integral limits, if you like. So now the rest is just mathematics. Um, so essentially, we just we get one minus uh, sorry, one, one second. So let's collect together. So we end up with h over eight. Basically, have square of two over here and h over two. And we take that all outside the integral limits because it's a constant. And so what we have instead is one minus psi d psi like that. And then we can just expand that out. And that gives us uh, 1 minus 2 psi plus psi squared, uh, yes, is it okay? Plus psi squared, yeah, d psi. Is it okay? Did I make a mistake? I think that's okay, right? So we just multiplied out that, and then we just did simply integrate that. So it's just h over 8 minus 1, 1, and it becomes psi. Sorry. We integrate it. Minus psi squared plus psi cubed over 3. And then we have just the limits. So that's just integrating. And then we go through the process of substituting in the limits. So it becomes h over 8 of brackets 1 minus 1 plus 1 over 3. 
minus brackets minus one minus one minus one over three so it's just just basically working through plenty of algebra and then that ends up giving you a form that is h over six um, so these two cancel out you get one third and then this becomes minus two and uh, two and a third add to that and then basically rearrange and you get h over six so feel free to check that i've also in the notes it's, it's done in kind of step-by-step -step detail the key point here is that if you try to do this directly without this kind of mapping here it is far more involved but you know all of this process from here to here is just just tedious algebra um, similarly you can do the same thing for n1 n2 dx you did the process of, of mapping to psi space and that ends up giving you h over three and the integral of n2 squared dx gives you h over six as well so um, feel free to look at the notes it's all shown in detail but the process is pretty much the same you instead stick in for this term it will be um, one minus psi over two times one plus psi over two and then for this term it's just one plus psi over two I'm sorry. Uh, yes sorry. sure please here on the lecture it's, uh, the it's uh, mixed up like uh, n1 squared is h uh, uh, divided by and then n1 uh, times n2 is h Right, have I made a mistake? It's, it's very possible. I, I always get these two around. So sorry, the so in the notes I've got h over three. You're right. So this, sorry, this should be h over six here, and this should be h over three. Is that? Yeah, I think you're probably right. <laughs> um, we can double check it. Probably should have done. So this should be equal to h over eight. Um, a third minus um, brackets minus two and one third. Um, does anyone have a calculator? I'm not, not very good at mathematics. So, um, so that ends up being basically two h over eight. Is that right? So h over four. Yeah, it doesn't look right, does it? Yeah, it's h over eight times h over three. Perfect. So, uh, times eight. <laughs> thank you very much. So then they cancel. Perfect. So it is h over three. Thank you. Brilliant. So so then that's h over six in the middle. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Brilliant. 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 So okay. So then let's collect all of that together. So if we go back to the original form, let's just rewrite that for integral between x one and x two of omega t dx. What we end up with is essentially um, omega 1 t1 and this is h over 3 for that term plus omega 2 t1 plus omega 1 t2 and that's h over 6 plus omega 2 t2 h over h over 3 <laughs> perfect okay so okay makes sense so essentially we're just substituting in those values from, from that integral process Okay, so now we do exactly the same thing we did before, where you remember we collected together all of the expressions in terms of omega 1 and omega 2, and then we form two simultaneous equations. So the idea is these two simultaneous equations are equations each of which, for each of the nodes individually, and then we accumulate all of those equations together in a matrix and solve a set of simultaneous equations for all of the different uh, lines, essentially, we're using to approximate. And a solution for all of those lines joined together give us the overall solution for the entire system. So the only difference here now is we have um, a set of extra terms here in omega 1 and 2 to add to the terms we normally have. So um, let me just click those together. So essentially we have um, in omega 1 brackets, we have the expressions for t1, t1, uh, h over 3. plus t2 h over 6, plus the original expressions we had up here for um, omega 1, which you can see is minus times minus, so it's plus 1 over h t2 minus t1 for that, plus, um, sorry, one second, 
remove all of this down. So just to make it clear that what we're doing here is basically um, the original integral. So this is the actual solution to the original integral um, d2t by dx squared plus t dx is equal to this whole expression here. And then the process we have for omega 2 we're collecting together. And that's t1 um, t1h over 6 plus t2 h over 3 and then this is now minus 1 over h t2 minus t1. The other term we should include here by the way is dt by dx for x1 there so and this should be minus yeah sorry one second uh, there we go and then it should be plus So the key point, I mean, all of these full details and hopefully correct details are included in the notes, but what I really want you to take from this is all we're doing is exactly the same process we did before. The only key difference here is there's now two extra terms that we've got, which are basically these two and these two, and these have come from this that really complicated integral process we've just done that essentially came from integrating this, this Helmholtz term here. So that process, we worked for all of that, and then essentially what we end up having is two simultaneous equations that are for omega-1 and omega-2. Okay, the last thing I want to show you, just so you start to get an idea of matrix notation, is actually the one way you could think of this. And bear in mind, we, we form you know, a matrix and we solve these simultaneous equations. But one of the things you could actually think about with this is you could actually think of this already as a matrix of cofactors times T1 and T2. So, so one thing you could actually have done already is actually have assembled these two expressions in matrix form. And when we go to two dimensions, that type of process just makes it slightly more streamlined so you know in this case you'd collect everything which is omega 1 and t1 here so that'd be h over 3 uh, minus 1 over h and then for example t2 times omega 1 that would be in this column would be h over 6 plus 1 over h and then for t2 in so for t1 in this column that would be h over 6 uh, plus 1 over h and similarly for this it'd be h um, h over 3 minus 1 over h. So you can see, you know, in, in multiple dimensions, actually working in matrix form makes life a little bit easier. And you can think of this being, you know, the K matrix, this being like a T matrix, and then you can say this is an omega matrix. And when you start looking at um, books on, on finite element, what typically people do is just work in matrix form, and then it makes it much simpler, because you don't have to collect each of the one and two terms. You just do everything in matrix form. As long as you stick to matrix arithmetic, then, then you know, you actually avoid all of that. And then just to, just to mention the index notation again, just in case you're used to using that, you can see in index notation, this would be how this would look. So essentially you can see, you know, the indices could be i and j, and you could just cycle through those. And again, when you come to code it, that form is, is kind of closer to what you would write in MATLAB. Um, okay, so then let's just go back to the, the presentation quickly, and then five more minutes and then we'll have a quick break. Um, so essentially the process here, as we've said, is you, you put everything into a matrix form, you're collecting together simultaneous equations. And you know, bear in mind that for a matrix of this form, and that's, that's the form you've just seen, you know, the process is one of collecting everything together that's multiplied by omega 1 and omega 2. You form two simultaneous equations and then you just stick those two simultaneous equations into a matrix. Um, the only difference from the terms you've seen so far is basically we've got these extra terms here and here. So that's the entire influence, if you like, of, of that extra term in the equations. So doing exactly what we did last time, essentially you can see that each of those is a, an equation for each of the individual elements. So element one is this equation here, element two is this equation, element three is, is this equation. Um, sorry, can you see that point? It's not very big, is it? Um, you know, and remember before I said, you know, this would be the integral between, say, x3 and x4 um, of, of the expression. So this would be omega d2t by dx squared plus t dx, you know, and so on. So each of these is basically forming that. We get exactly the same matrix for each of those. The key difference is, is, is basically the t1 and t2, or t2 and t3, depending on element. And then we pad our elements out. So bear in mind that, you know, each of these elements essentially um, 
The position they are in the matrix is to do with which T1, T2, T3. For the first element, it's only multiplying T1 and T2, so it's basically just the top left of this matrix, the T2 and T3 are in the middle, and then the T3 and 4 on the bottom right. And we can add all, all of them together and essentially assemble a global matrix from each of the local ones. Conceptually, all we're doing here is assembling a series of simultaneous equations. So we formed a simultaneous equation for each of the elements, or each of the nodes of the elements, put them all together, and then the, the, the process is we want to solve that kind of global system of equations. For the right-hand side, again, you've already seen this, but we, we haven't got a forcing term as we had last week. All we have are these fluxes. Um, and, you know, the fluxes you can see here are essentially, um, for each of the different expressions, you can see the same flux um, on the right-hand side. So this, this flux here is this flux here and also this flux here. So you can see they're equal and opposite and they cancel out. Um, and the fluxes are the difference between temperatures. So flux is the temperature gradient driving heat, if you like, or flow of fluid. So any, any gradient will drive a, a flow, you know, in a physical sense. And you know, this is why pressure difference gives you a, a flow of fluid, if you like. But essentially what we have here is at the point where they meet, those fluxes cancel out. And you can see what we end up with is essentially just an expression where the flux is at the end, or the, the boundary conditions define the entire system. So everything internal cancels. This is one dimension. This becomes much more important in two dimensions. You imagine you've got very, very complicated shapes. The point is we choose shapes that tessellate. Some of the shapes tessellate, the flow out of one shape into the next one cancel out. And then again, you are defined by the boundary conditions. So you know, this, this process might seem trivial here, or not trivial, at least um, you know, not particularly interesting, but it becomes more important in, in multiple dimensions. And then we saw this last week with boundary conditions, these, this idea of two different types, Dirichlet or, or specifying the variable and Neumann boundary conditions. Physically, these are displacement, flow velocity or temperature for the um, uh, solid mechanics or Navier equation, Navier-Stokes equation or t uh, energy equation, respectively. And then their derivatives can be things like strain, strain rate or, or heat flux. Um, yeah, so the last thing I'll show you, and I haven't put this on Blackboard yet, but I'll, I'll stick it on just after the lecture, but essentially what we can do is we collect together all of these matrices, um, and we solve it using exactly the same process we solved before. So this was the solution you've already looked at. You know the form that we expect is a series of sines and cosines. What we're now going to get for this is a kind of element-based or, or linear piecewise function to that, that, that equation. So we're enforcing the zero boundary condition by deleting the top row, um, sorry, the bottom row here. So you can see we essentially eliminate this, this row here, everything multiplying the T4 term, and delete that. For the top boundary condition, which we're fixing to be equal to 100, we delete that top row, and then we basically move that T1 value to the right-hand side and multiply it by the um, expression here. So this was the process I showed you last week of applying boundary conditions. Um, and you can see, you know, essentially, this is kind of the standard in one-dimensional process, and it was that kind of idea of simultaneous equations where you get total and known value. When you get told a known value, you basically rearrange your equation and move it to the right-hand side and reduce the number of equations by one. So that's the process. We set this one to zero, we reduce the number of equations by deleting a row. And with this one, we delete the, the top row and we move the known solution to the right-hand side. So it's just, just a process of reducing our number of simultaneous equations using the known information of the boundary condition. So the, 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 the solution we end up with is basically uh, this matrix, exactly the same solution you saw last week, but just with these extra terms. Um, and then here's the MATLAB code for that. And I'll show you that just after the break, I think, just to give you uh, 10 minutes just to relax. And then we'll go through the two-dimensional solution, um, or the two-dimensional shape function, which is a triangle, essentially, as the last part of this lecture. So if you want to take 10 minutes just to, just to relax, and uh, any questions, feel free to come and ask. <coughs> Just to show you how these work, um, this is the example that we've just seen here. So it's exactly the same example we saw before with these extra terms now in the matrix. Um, and then you end up basically having uh, an extra term on the right-hand side. Um, for the T1 solution, I think here, um, which I think is maybe inconsistent. But it's essentially for this, you should see a result that is... Basically, and this, this now shows you basically what you were solving before. Now you can see this is between zero and one, so you don't see much of the, the, the sine or cosine. It's actually a very, very small section of it. Um, but you can see the boundary conditions are satisfied. It's, it's 100 there, 
and it goes down to zero there. So it's essentially a, a line defined by a cosine or a plus sign between those two points. The straight line is the analytical solution that we solved at the beginning of this lecture. Oh. And then the, the, the points here show you the elements. Um, and you can see, you know, they're essentially look quite a reasonable approximation. Now, if you look at the... Um, yes, sorry, right, let me just go back to this. So, okay, this was the process of solving the equation that we've just reduced in terms of numbers of boundary conditions. More generally, um, just a note on, on how you actually apply this in MATLAB code. If you want to apply constant boundary conditions, actually you keep the rows and, and columns in there and you just set the, the element equal to 1. Now what you can see this does is essentially 1 times t1 is equal to t1. So essentially that's just a trivial simultaneous equation if you like. It's just saying t1 is equal to t1. The bottom one is saying t4 is equal to t4. So just in terms of implementing it in a computer, you can keep the matrix as large as it was before and actually just set the rows to zero um, in order to do that. So if you look at how we do that in the code, um, I'm not expecting you to understand this right away. This will be kind of uh, what we'll start working through in the laboratory sessions. But, but essentially what you're doing here is setting columns and rows to equal to zero. And then you're specifying that you just want those elements to be equal to one. And then on the right hand side, you're specifying the values of top bottom, uh, top boundary condition, bottom boundary condition, which we've set here to zero and 10. So for this general solution, which we'll run here in MATLAB, in this case, I put 20 elements and you can see I've actually taken a wider range from zero to five. So you can see, you know, the, the approximation for sine and cosine. Now, what we can do is we can take much longer ranges. So let's say we took 15, keeping 20 elements. And what you can see is that the elements start to be a poorer and poorer approximation. So if we only have, in this particular case, we have 15, uh, a domain size of 15. So that's physically, you know, 15 long. And you can think of this maybe being like a guitar string. Where you've actually got that, and we're trying to approximate that using a series of finite elements. So we've got 20 elements here, and you can already see there's quite big errors. So what we would ideally do now is start to increase the number of elements. And increasing the number of elements, you can then see that we actually get a much better approximation to the function. So you can now see these points are actually agreeing very, very well. So, you know, in, in the work you've done before with finite elements, you talked a bit about kind of resolution and, and mesh sensitivity studies. And what you should do with this code and what, what we'll do in the, in the, in the hands-on exercise is start to get an idea of how many elements you need to approximate a function. So let's say we've got an exact sign. You know, how many elements gives you a good approximation? And what happens if we keep increasing elements? Um, and, you know, is there a limiting case where is there enough elements that we get the right answer? And the key point is there's never a right answer or we can never reach the right <laughs> answer. Um, you know, the sine and cosines are kind of the exact solution, but all we can get is an approximation with this kind of finite element process. Um, so again, those I'll, I'll upload to Blackboard. You're welcome to play around with them before the hands-on session, and then um, we'll work through there. Okay, so we finished one dimensions. Hopefully everyone has at least a, a good understanding of, of the process. So now we're going to move to two-dimensional uh, differential equations. So we're going to talk briefly about solving uh, two-dimensional differential equations, and then I'm going to spend the rest of today just talking about the, the two-dimensional triangular shape function. So. In the same way we derived uh, a straight line that has the properties of n1 and n2 that, that essentially defines a series of like joint elements, we do exactly the same thing with triangles now. Um, and these triangles are an approximation to, in two dimensions. And then I'll talk a bit about the process of solving equations, which is um, essentially exactly the same process we've seen several times now. So okay, two-dimensional fields. And I talked about this in the first lecture when I was kind of giving you the brief overview of the, of the subject. Consider a two-dimensional polynomial. Now, the key points about this polynomial is it has dependence on both x and y. Um, you know, and this is some function of x and y. So it's a two-dimensional function, which means at any point in space in x and y, there should be a third value. And you can picture this as a kind of contour plot or a, a three-dimensional, a surface, sorry, in three dimensions. So a hill, for example, you could express as a function of x and y, as the positions in, you know, um, laterally and longitudinally, and then that point would be the height, if you like. Um, and this is just a polynomial, uh, parabolic in this case that you've already seen, and it has this kind of cross term and then just a constant term. A, B, C, D, E and F are just constants, coefficients. And again, I'll put a MATLAB code online, you can actually plot this function. I encourage you to, to try what happens when you try different coefficients. So set all of them to zero, set all of the x1s to zero and see what you see. In that case, you'll go back to a one-dimensional that varies only in one direction. For a set of values, you can see this kind of forms quite a nice, you know, interesting curved surface. Looks a bit like a saddle. Um, 
and this is a surface plot in MATLAB. So here's the code to get that. You can also do a kind of contour plot and then stick a color bar. So what it changes, this shouldn't be a capital C by the way for the MATLAB code to work. But you know, just specify a range of different A, B, C, D, E, and F values. We get a, get a, um, a surface. Now this is looking down at it as a contour plot. So you can see you know, the, the, the kind of variation in, in X and Y, and then it just has a different value at different points. So essentially we can define derivatives in this particular case, and that's you know, by defining a function, um, a function that varies essentially between x and x plus delta x. So it's the same process we saw in one dimensions where we look at basically the difference between two points and we define a gradient. In two dimensions we do exactly the same thing, and we can define a two-dimensional uh, difference, and a difference between that element as that element gets smaller and smaller and smaller gives us a derivative. Now the key point here with partial derivatives is always when you look at them and see say df dx, the key point is y is held constant, or in fact everything else is held constant. So a partial derivative implicitly implies that everything else is constant, although this isn't normally written. So you know for this case y is held constant about the middle point, but you know this, this same concept of one dimensions where you take a function and you're you're taking a gradient, it's just the, the two dimensional generalization. Do the same thing in y, that's the difference between y at x plus delta x minus f of x at y divided by y. And again, as the, the element gets smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it becomes a point. And this allows us to define derivatives, um, changes df dx and df dy. And these are basically lines that are constant um, in x and y moving across that surface. So hopefully you're all familiar with those. And then just mathematically, if you work through that process for this polynomial, we get expressions for first derivative and second derivative for this polynomial surface. Just want to emphasize this surface is just an example. The actual underlying function that we're modeling in, in finite element analysis is probably too complex to express in a kind of closed form or simple form, but you know, just so you can visually understand this, this is just an example of a two-dimensional function. Okay, so the finite element method. Basically, we're, we're going to try and solve an equation here that's exactly the, the, the diffusion equation you've already seen. If you cover up this first term here, it's exactly what you've solved already several times. <coughs> Excuse me. But now we have the second term that's essentially the derivative in the second, uh, in the y dimension. So we actually have now a two dimensional differential equation or partial differential equation. But mathematically, we can think of it in exactly the same way. So remember before we're solving an equation of the form au minus f is equal to zero. The only difference now is that a is basically just these two operators, d in x and d2 dy in y, uh, here in y. And f, f is equal to zero again in this case. So the process is exactly the same. We're basically going to approximate that same expression using a series of elements. The key point now is the elements are no longer lines because we're in two dimensions, they're triangles. And the process we're going to use is essentially least squares fitting. So we're fitting a set of least squares elements, which is kind of integrated over the domain with some weighting function to minimize that error between this series, this surface made of loads of joined elements that tessellate. And they eventually kind of, we basically minimize the error so that we get the best possible approximation to that differential equation from a series of elements. So it's exactly the same process as with the straight lines, but now using two dimensional triangle functions. Um, and so really, you know, the process we're using, looking down on it again, if we wanted to approximate the function f as a function of x and y, is one of defining a series of elements and then just working through to, to fit that and, and getting an approximation for that underlying function. And again, we're using triangles, and I'll show you just with the last bit of today, uh, the basic shape function as a triangle. The actual solution process for the finite element method is basically exactly the same in multiple dimensions. We just basically do it for both of these terms. So we end up with, with basically integration by parts plus a surface term. Now the key point here is this surface term is the, actually a surface term. You think about what you've actually got with a triangle, um, you know, you've actually got fluxes over the surface, so it's no longer just at the nodes. So this surface term is genuinely a surface term, and we use the expression d gamma, which we'll come back to, but you know, the key point is actually that the, the process is exactly the same. Just, you know, mathematically integration by parts, split it into a, a part that we can approximate using functions, and then a surface term. Now the functions we're going to use now are a function of 3, n1, n2, and n3, and that's because it's actually a triangle function. And then the process of solving is identical. We collect together the simultaneous equations, stick them in a matrix, invert that matrix, and get the solution. So hopefully the kind of process of going through in one dimension is at least giving you most of the basic idea of this. So the next step is basically to define a triangular element. So let me just show you...
And the, the series of slides on this, which you'll have, what I want to do is just work through in the last 10 minutes just the first part of this mathematically. Um, so let me just exit this. Okay. Let's go to a new page. Okay, so let's say we've got some triangle element. Now before, do you remember if we had um, straight lines, essentially what we'd be doing is we'd be defining the values at say u1 and u2. Now we have three points which are u3. And these u3 are basically the u value at x1, y1. u value at x2, y2. And the u value at x3, y3. So we're just basically now doing it in two dimensional space where these are x, y coordinates. So essentially the, the, the terminology we had before of nodes at the corners and then elements where this is itself one particular element. Okay, now the actual approximation for this, this function, u, x, y, is, is approximated using alpha 1 plus alpha 2 times x plus alpha 3 times y. So this is essentially an expression that describes mathematically this, this triangle function. So it's some value alpha 1, which is a point in space, plus the, the coordinate in x and the coordinate in y. So essentially this, this is you know, a general polynomial that describes this triangle function exactly. So now what we need to do, in the same way we did with a straight line, where we took mx plus c, and we solved for the known values of u1 and u2, we're going to take this function for the triangle, and we're going to solve for the known values alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. Exactly the same process. So essentially we know that u1 is going to be equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 times x1 plus alpha 3 times x1. That's u1 is just x1, y1. u2 is equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 x2 plus alpha 3 x2. Uh, sorry, this should be y2. So y1 and y2. And then u3 is equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 x3 plus alpha 3 y3. Does that seem okay? So essentially all we've done is just substituting the three values we know into this expression for um, a triangle. So essentially what we have now is three simultaneous equations. Now instead of trying to solve these manually, you're, you're you know, perfectly possible to do that. We better just assemble them into a matrix, which is of the form u1, u2, u3, is equal to... If we collect the terms, so we have all of the coefficients here times alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3, like that. So it's just rewriting these simultaneous equations in matrix form, as we've done a few times, um, just to kind of aid us to solve them. And again, you could try to solve these manually, but um, you know the process is, is not trivial. So in matrix form, we can write this as u is equal to some matrix c times the matrix alpha. So then that means the alpha, the coefficients that we want to find, are going to be equal to c to the minus 1 times u. So we're basically just going to invert this matrix and move it over to the other side in order to get the values of alpha that will define our triangle. Does that seem okay? Everyone happy with that? Okay, perfect. So now comes the process of inverting a matrix. Um, so essentially... I won't bore you with the details of this. Let me just go back to the slides, because I think, given time, we probably don't want to sit and watch me try to do that. Um, so this is basically the process of rewriting the equations. And then the unknown coefficients, which we've just seen, and we're now solving for alpha. OK, so essentially you can go through the process. You transpose the matrix. You write the matrix of cofactors. You also get the determinant of the matrix, which is basically this, this series of expressions. Um, and then you work through and you, you can basically invert a matrix yourself. Um, I would encourage you to go away and do that just to, just to kind of understand the process and feel like you, you've, uh, you've done it. But actually, probably what's easier um, is if you go to, say, this website. Um, so if we take... So if you have to do any kind of tedious mathematical task like this, Probably the easiest thing to do is just go to a website like Wolfram Alpha. MATLAB offers something similar. And then you can actually write algebraically just that you want the inverse of 
and then you just put the matrix in and it will actually work through for you and it will give you the solution to that so certain things you should definitely do yourself to fully understand certain things like inverting matrix like this it's probably easier just to do it um, online but you know I, I think with this just to convince you this process um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a, an easier way to, to do kind of tedious algebra or do it yourself manually and then check afterwards. It's well worth doing that to make sure. Okay, so let's, let's talk a bit about the interpretation of the various terms in this matrix. So what you can see is the actual expressions in the matrix that you get. Um, so let me just go back. So if you look at these various terms, y2 minus y3, so this term here, for example, you can see that's basically y2 minus y3, it's this distance here, for example. And say um, x3 minus x2 is this distance here, for example. So each of these different terms in the matrix are actually corresponding to some element of the triangle. And the top row actually corresponds to basically the three parts of the area of the triangle. The determinant itself actually ends up being an expression for twice the area. Now to convince yourself of that, you actually have to basically use trapezium rule, define the area underneath that, calculate the area of this triangle, calculate the area of this triangle, and then calculate the area of, of this, sorry, this trapezium here, and the difference between those will give you this expression for twice the area. So, you know, all of these expressions here for the various terms um, are worth kind of thinking about and understanding, uh, you know, in, in the form. But essentially what you end up with a matrix here is the inverse is the top row are basically two times the three components of area of the triangle, A1, A2, A3, where the sum of those gives you the total area of the triangle. The next row gives you B1, B2, B3, which are actually the distances. Now notice, say for example, B1 is the, the distance between element 2 and 3, for example. So B2 is the difference between 1 and 3. So it's the difference between the two that, that, that aren't the same index, if that makes sense, or the ones opposite. Um, and then you've got A1, which are basically the X components of that. So you know this matrix geometrically makes sense, and it, it has a kind of clear interpretation. Um, and what I'll do is I'll put up a series of notes that work through this, again in, in, in LaTeX form where you can, can look through. Um, but mathematically then the process is one of basically taking that expression for this, um, this matrix. Can we keep that? So essentially our C to the minus 1 is equal to uh, 2A1, 2A2, 2A3. B1, B2, B3, A1, A2, A3, and this is 1 over 2A here. So essentially what we do is we can actually now re-express alpha alpha, we can actually re-express alpha in terms of these expressions and then substitute them into the original expressions for U1, U2 and U3 and then collect together the terms to get our expressions for N1, N2 and N3. Um, Again, we've only got about five minutes left, I probably won't. Let me just give you a rough idea how that would work. So, um, let's take just the first element, for example. C1 minus that times uh, U. So that's going to be equal to... Um, so this is U1, U2, U3. For C to the minus 1 times U. So what that's going to give us is this first element times this, which will be 2a1 u1 plus, uh, and we'll take this element, so this would be plus b1 plus a1, and this would all be times u1, and then we get the second expression for u2, which would be 2a2 plus b2 plus a2 times u2 plus 2a3 plus b3 plus a3. So again, please work through this and just kind of convince yourself this is okay, but the point is this will then become n3, this expression becomes n2, and this expression here becomes so it's n1, and this becomes n2. So the process we have here is exactly what we've done in one dimensions of basically collecting together simultaneous equations, solving them to get the coefficients, substituting those coefficients and then collecting together the terms in U1, U2 and U3 in order to get N1, N2 and N3, which are our um, shape functions as we called them before. So once we've done that, we then have our expression, say for N1, and then we can start to 
define things like these partial derivatives. So what's nice, and this is called the constant strain triangle because the derivatives of this function are constant. So if we take the derivative, for example, of n1 here, so dn1 by dx, you can see the only x dependence is here. So we actually end up, basically, all of these become zero, and the only thing left is b1, for example. So the derivative in x and y are both constants. And again, this gives us this nice property that we can just directly integrate that directly without having to worry about the details. So if we collect together the derivative in x and y of the elements, you can see essentially what we get is, is basically um, a series of constants for each of that, which allows us nice, nice properties. So that's it. That's really what I wanted to show you today. I, what I'll do is I'll put up a kind of more detailed description of these various properties. And in any finite element textbook, they will give you this full discussion of um, the con what's called the constant strain triangle. It's conceptually what we've got is exactly the same thing we've already seen for a straight line. It's a really nice function. It tessellates in space, which means we have this nice property that we can rewrite it as these two first order terms plus the surface term. The derivatives themselves are constant, which makes the integral very, very easy to use. Um, and then the process which we'll start doing next week is basically to take this, this two-dimensional function, use exactly the same trick of integration by parts, stick in this triangle, uh, triangular approximations into that, collect the simultaneous equations together for each of these nodes and elements, and then solve them, as we did before. So that's it. Just, just today, to give you an overview, we basically talked a lot about the one-dimensional equation. Briefly talked about MATLAB, and then we've, we've basically gone and talked about two-dimensional elemental shape functions. Um, so I'll see you at 11 o'clock on next Tuesday for the lab session. Um, and as I say, I'll, what I'll do is I'll put up a basic introduction and then a range of more complicated examples. Um, and if anyone has anything in particular they'd like me to go through again or cover or show you in MATLAB, please send me an email, stick it online, stick it on Blackboard. Um, and again, office hours today at four o'clock, so if anyone wants to come and ask questions, please do. When will you be making the assignment brief So, what I wanted to do is have one lab session where we basically just go through MATLAB, and then I'll make it available ready for the next lab. So, just because I want to I make sure, just get an idea where everyone is in MATLAB, and, and go through that, and then I'll be available. So, in terms of date... So by the 5th of November, which gives you a month to, to finish it. Um,